Let me start by asking you about your plans because you're already hoping to boost annual lending to $20 billion from $12 billion. And you've already said in the past yourself that the U.S. really has not sufficiently been concerned with the IDB. So why this change now? Yeah. Well, look, the financing needs of the region are about $25 billion. It's no secret that it's been the region in the world hardest hit by the COVID crisis. We all know the numbers, the 8 to 9 percent drop in GDP growth, uh, the, the level of people increasing and in additions into the poverty rate uh, and extreme poverty uh, in the region. But look, we understand the diagnostics. We're looking at the opportunities. We're looking at how to get out of this crisis so that Latin America doesn't have another lost decade. And the way we're going to do so is through job creation, through digitalization, through to increase some small, medium-sized businesses, and through through nearshoring. We're going to be the flagship of nearshoring. The opportunities here are huge. Uh, that's what we're going to be focused on. And to do that, we are the lender of choice in the region. There's huge fiscal pressures going on in a lot of these countries. They're having to decide whether they're, they're going to save lives today or mortgage uh, their children's futures. We want to be the lender of choice for them. If we don't do it, there's going to be some sovereign lender out there that's going to step up to the plate. And at the end of the day, this bank is majority owned by the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. They trust us. We are the brand of confidence. And we need to be financially relevant enough to meet those needs at this time. Already a country has stepped up to the plate, right? And we're talking about China. They are now the biggest provider of financing to Latin America. So can the IDB actually uh, sort of plant uh, China in that sense? Well, China's lending to the region has gone down from $35 billion in 2010 to just $1 billion in 2019. So that's increased the need. We should be filling that gap. The IDB should be filling that gap. The United States is a 30% shareholder in the IDB. The, Latin American, the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, own over 50% of the shareholding. It's their bank. Uh, it's their primary uh, lender of preference. But to do so, we need to be financially relevant. As you said before, the United States has missed the opportunity. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats, there's never been a champion in the United States Congress for the IDB. We're going to change that. Uh, in 2015, when IDB Invest, our private sector arm, merged out, the United States invested nothing. But you know who did? Uh, China. That was a lost opportunity because of what we can do in the region. And look, in all sorts of things, just creative. Let me give you an, ex an amazing example. Just recently, I had the CEO of Loud and Live in my office last week. They put together the marketing campaign for McDonald's with Jay Balvin. Like Michael Jordan before, et cetera, Jay Balvin is now, you can go to McDonald's and get a Jay Balvin, you know, the Latin uh, uh, superstar. You can get a Jay Balvin meal there. That entire creative uh, campaign was done in Medellin, Colombia, because Jay Balvin could not travel to New York to do it. So a campaign that would have been done for McDonald's internationally, right here in the United States, was done entirely in Medellin, Colombia, and it came out amazing. Digital, the orange economy, huge opportunities in the region. We need to be able to sell it. We need to be able to, one, uh, let them get out of their current needs, and we're going to be the champions of nearshoring. We're going to be the champions of promoting that investment uh, towards the region because the opportunities exist there. The opportunities exist and they exist now and it's great to have you with us and I'm interested in about how you speed up the efficiency. This was something you talked a lot about when you first took the role. You said it was unacceptable that it takes about seven months for the bank to approve lending. How do you make sure that you can approve faster, efficiently, but without lacking in any standards? Yeah, well, I think right now uh, the board has learned uh, that we want to do things faster and better, uh, and that's what we're doing. Uh, we've been, we've already been working nonstop. And by the way, we're presenting a concept paper this week on the needs for a capital increase. So that even started before I saw in October 1st. Uh, we already have uh, the needs aligned. Uh, we already have our streamlining the processes so that we can do uh, more effective lending to the region. But I inherited a budget, uh, and that's my reality. And I'm already looking to uh, be able to program uh, not only to create more space for more lending right now uh, uh, by working with the board and working with our management teams to find opportunities uh, to create more financing, but also mobilize more uh, from the private sector. And I think that that's a huge opportunity that exists. I had said before, and I said it during the campaign, IDB Invest, which is a tremendous tool, uh, mobilizes uh, just over a, a, a dollar uh, for, for every dollar uh, lent. Uh, we need to get to the level of, for example, our Development Finance Corporation in the United States, uh, which, was, which, which mobilizes three to four dollars. Uh, there's a lot of work to do there, but just look at that. And look, let me tell you, the level of excitement, you know, we're putting together our leaders leadership team here, uh, and, and that leadership team, which will be more fully announced uh, this week, are people that have huge confidence from the private sector, from institutional investors right there in New York and otherwise, that are looking for opportunities, are looking for us to be stewards of, of investments in the region. I think we could do that. So it's not just about what we have in our public sheet, which is going to be extraordinary to help the fiscal needs and the fiscal pressures of the region, but it's going to be about what we mobilize, the level of confidence. I would love to do, you know, one of the biggest problems institutional investors have in Latin America and the Caribbean is that they can only invest the objective standards uh, in 
OECD mm. countries, of which there's only four in Latin America and the Caribbean. We want to create our own standards so that they have easier ways and better standards of investment uh, in the region so we can be a brand of confidence for uh, institutional investors as well in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, Mauricio, I mean, you articulate a very clear vision here for the bank. And, of course, uh, you were nominated uh, under a Trump administration, an administration that, depending on the outcome of the November uh, 3rd election, uh, may be no more. Uh, you would have to work with a new president uh, and potentially a new Congress, uh, a presidential candidate in Joe Biden, who opposed your nomination to that bank. How would you go about carrying out your mission should there be a change in presidential administrations? Look, I'm going to be able to work with whoever comes in. And I have a long record of working with both Republicans and Democrats. And at the end of the day, whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump, the goals and objectives for development in the region are the same. Joe Biden, when he was vice president, had uh, the Alliance for Prosperity. The Trump administration created America Crece, which were the energy and infrastructure finance uh, uh, frameworks with the region, of which half of which uh, half of the region has signed with now. At the end of the day, those objectives are the same. The IDB as a tool has been underappreciated and utilized by both Democrats and Republicans. Like I said, it has never had a champion. And I think now, with this energy that we're bringing into this, with this clear vision that we're take, articulating, which meets the objectives of both Democrats and Republicans, of whether it's the Alliance for Prosperity or whether it's America Crece, is completely cohesive in that regards. And you're going to see in the United States Congress an authorization for a capital increase has to go through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Financial Services Committee. I've already talked to both Republicans and Democrats in both committees. I think there's a new level of excitement because we're going to do things a bit differently mm. here. There's transformational opportunities. And let me tell you, if the IDB is not the lender of choice of the region, China will be. And that's going to be on the United States Congress if they don't take up this opportunity. How much representation will you have from those countries that actually opposed your nomination? Oh, look. I've, the, the day after the election, I was on the phone with President Fernandez from Argentina, President Piñera from Chile, and, and uh, President Alvarado uh, from Costa Rica. And we already have a cohesive vision. There's no disagreement in the vision I, I presented. The only disagreement there was during the campaign was my nationality. But guess what? We're over that. We're working all in unison now, trying to find a consensus vision and working towards that. You know, my predecessor, when he was first elected, he had the support of 20 out of the 28 countries in the region and won with only 56%. Right. I won with almost 68% and the support of 23 out of 28 countries in the region. Mm. I have a vision, I have a consensus, and I have the support of the region. And by the way, we're creating a leadership team that for the first time in 61 years is going to be composed almost exclusively of the small countries. 19 of the 26 countries in the region uh, of our borrowing nations are small countries. And they're right. going to have opportunities now to be represented unlike ever before. And I'm very proud of that.